Eddie Stobart is shifting it up a gear. Away we go then. Let's turn and burn. From Cornwall to Kilbride, they're among the kings of road and rail. Readying the runway as Southend Airport lifts off to more destinations than ever. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. What's next, please? Unleashing ultra modern kit. It's a milk float on steroids. As you can see, it's a bigger. <laughs> They're rampaging through rocky runs. Come on! It's a little bit of a, uh, a white knuckle ride at the moment. Braving the wildest weather. I don't like snow. One minute there, it was clear, and the next minute, couldn't see nothing. And heading off their hardest hauls. Mental, this, isn't it? I can't even see where I'm going to get to. But the pressure is always on. <laughs> to keep the red and green at the top of their game. Let's keep going, fighting, fighting through it. We're, uh, we're up against it a little bit at the moment. 16.59, and that's beer for five o'clock. <laughs> Coming up, treacherous winter weather pushes ice-cool Gareth Ayres to the limit. Yeah, it's a little bit of a, uh, a white-knuckle ride at the moment. Last thing we want to do is, uh, is get blown off a road like this. Paul Steele's new baby is put through her paces on one of Britain's most dangerous roads. People think it's a long, straight road, so I think they've never taken you. They get frustrated, sat behind you. Most case scenario is accidents, really, isn't it? It's got to keep your wits about you. And Ian O'Neill's sunny drop clouds over when his sat-nav hits a bum note. I'm trying to get to the Opera House. Excuse me, do you know where the Opera House is? This haulage firm first delivered fertiliser to Cumbria in a single truck. Four decades on, and the business now transports everything from reindeer to Formula One cars all over Europe. In 2012, the company bought a transporter business worth 12.4 million. With a fleet of 450 trucks and trailers, they now count 100 grand cars among their diverse drops. I don't think there's much that, um, that we don't deliver now. Uh, maybe lambs or babies. The man at the helm of a half million pound load today is 40-year-old transporter tramper Gareth Ayres. The book stops with me. It's my job to uh, load them safely, drive them there safely and deliver them at the other end. It's 1.30 p.m. and snowing as our trucker heads out of a West Midlands car depot pulling seven motors. We've got some uh, expensive four-wheel drive vehicles on board. There's a lot of responsibility on my shoulders when you've got an expensive load like this. Today, Gareth will be heading 128 miles south out of Solihull to Southampton Docks. Reloaded with 10 more cars, it's then a marathon 198 mile trek northwest to dealerships in Crewe and Warrington. With cargo like this, he's the envy of every tramper, but Gareth can't afford a slip in this weather. The last thing we want to do is uh, put some scratches on these alloys. One wheel alone's about £1,000. So if you damage four wheels, that's £4,000. An hour later, steadily inching down the M40 past Oxford, the bad weather worsens. It's snowy and windy now. It's, it's certainly uh, checking us about a little bit as we're driving down here. You can sort of feel the truck moving and, uh, and swaying slightly. You've got to really keep your wits about you when it's like this. With Gareth's 18 years' experience, this monster machine should be in safe hands. But even this pro's on edge. It's a little bit of a, uh, a white-knuckle ride at the moment. You tend to find that your palms get a bit sweaty and you're, you're sort of gripping the steering wheel and, uh, you know, you're just trying to uh, sort of keep the, uh, the truck on the straight and narrow. At 18.75 metres long, our diligent driver must steer a steady course to prevent the worst from happening. Last thing we want to do is get blown off a road like this. Getting involved in an accident on one of these doesn't really sort of bear thinking about. It's everybody's worst nightmare. You could do a lot of damage and a lot of injury with a machine like this. 
This cautious trucker doggedly pushes on through 60 miles of wind and sleet. And by four o'clock, his load in mint condition, Gareth arrives at the dock. At 80 hectares, equivalent to 640 Olympic swimming pools, Southampton docks is one enormous floating car park. It processes 650,000 vehicles, worth more than 18 billion pounds each year. The difficult journey may be behind him, but this 42-ton beast won't unload itself. We want to get this done quick. We're losing, uh, we're losing daylight, but obviously we've still got to do it, you know, safely and securely. To be polished enough to unload these prizes, Gareth undertook a four-week training program. It's a bit like a, um, a jigsaw puzzle, is this? Levers operate a sophisticated hydraulic system, allowing him to move each car deck independently. You know, you've got to make all the decks meet. Everything's got to, uh, you know, everything's got to be sort of done right. Obviously, the last thing we want to do is get them this far and then, uh, and then damage the vehicle. That would be, uh, that would be disaster. Made by Transporter Engineering, this trailer is model Evo 5. Fully loaded, it weighs in at 42 tonnes and is almost five metres high. This monster machine can hold up to 12 cars at a time on individual stainless steel decks. The trailer is powered with 180 to 190 metres of hydraulic hoses, with each transporter worth over £170,000. They are now the highest spec vehicles in the Stobart fleet. Get the skids out so we can uh, run the vehicles off. Costing up to 100 grand each, any damage to one of the 4x4s in this wet weather could be expensive. Gareth must steadily reverse the first car down without it slipping. And does it without a hitch. It's very wide on the truck, it's pretty tight, there's not a lot to play with. An hour's painstaking work later, and our cautious crusader rolls his last ride off. Bingo, that's your lot. It's almost five, and there's less than an hour of daylight to get the transporter reloaded for his next drop. Ten more expensive cars to put on, and uh, we want to try and get them on before it gets too dark, so we'll uh, we'll get Beaver in the way. With another 500 grand load and 100 miles to cover to a safe overnight stop, Gareth's got no time to lose. Coming up, can tanker pro Mark Ashurst battle darkness? to keep the Carlisle depot on the road. We're going up there at its range, snow, hail, wind, whatever. And will cautious crusader Gareth Ayres get his flash cars loaded before nightfall? We're losing the light fast. If we do with some Wembley-style floodlights down here. These famous trucks are thirsty beasts, doing nine miles to the gallon adding up to an annual £125 million fuel bill. With 15 tankers dropping fuel directly to Stobart depots all over the UK, company bosses save millions in delivery costs. But keeping the fuel pumping through the veins of the haulage industry is a dangerous job. Even the best tanker drivers, they all have accidents at some point or another. 46-year-old Mark Ashurst has been one of Stobart's tanker drivers for three years, but with a career spanning three decades, he's seen and done it all. I've worked on industrial waste, chemical tankers, fuel tankers, Manchester Airport refuelling aircraft. With poor weather expected across the north, this could be a tough shift as Mark readies his 14-ton tanker for a night drive out of Widnes in Cheshire. I think it's got to get down to about minus two, minus three tonight because it's, it's only at half five now and it's starting to get cold. It's quite a new wagon, this, so it's got plenty of tread on tyres, so we should be all right there. 
Mark's run today starts with a 22-mile trip from the Widnes Depot in Cheshire to Eastern Refinery at Ellesmere Port, where he'll fill the tanker. It's then a three-hour, 144-mile ride north through the mountainous Lake District to the Carlisle Depot. Having loaded up at Ellesmere Port, he hits the road. And with 36,000 litres of diesel on board, Mark's carrying the liquid equivalent of nine elephants in the back. The thing is with liquid, that once you stop, start slowing down, your liquid will still keep moving forward, so it's always pushing against you. And when you start pulling away, it'll run to the back, so it's pulling you back then. You don't want that charging towards you. Careful driving is a must. So the thing is to work with it and just Brake slowly and accelerate slowly so he doesn't swell about too much. With 2,000 trucks on the road at any one time, the business burns through around 96 million litres of fuel a year. That's equivalent to 470 flights to Australia. It's thirsty work, so their 15 tankers are constantly on the road, picking up fuel from 15 refineries in the UK and delivering it to 11 Stobart sites. Carlisle is the most northern English depot and is crucial since it refuels all the wagons going on deliveries into Scotland. Whatever the conditions to come, this solitary soldier must get the fuel to Carlisle. It doesn't do it any good to be running out of fuel, so we're going up there and it's rain, snow, hail, wind, whatever. With enough fuel on board to fill 72 wagons, Mark climbs the M6 through Cumbria. But as he crosses Shap Fell, at 320 metres above sea level, one of the highest points on any motorway in the UK, the temperature plummets. Minus three now, minus four. I said in the space of about two miles there, it's dropped four degrees. Lowest it's been so far is minus five. Manus 6, didn't think it was going to get so cold. Manus 17 is about the lowest I've seen, near Abingdon, heading towards Scotland. With the tarmac icing over and no lights on this stretch of motorway, driving demands full concentration. Yeah, it's pitch black. If it were for these other wagons coming out of the way and cars, see nothing. Not a nice place for we'll be breaking down, is it? Truck and trucker take it steady through this 10-mile stretch. And by 8.30 p.m., they head back down the peaks onto the better-lit A road into the Carlisle depot. Not exactly Bermuda short weather, is it? Mark hooks his tanker up to the depot's fuel tank and pumps in the diesel. And if you just see it, uh, you can actually see it going up. I keep my eye on them now. He switches the hose to empty each of the tanker's six compartments. Half an hour later, in spite of the freezing temperatures, the diesel's dumped. Good pace on that, travelling up here. Having battled the elements, Mark and his tanker head off. Safe in the knowledge, the Carlisle trucks will keep rolling. At the other end of the country, 337 miles away, transporter tramper Gareth Ayres has also braved the weather to make his first drop at Southampton docks. With less than an hour of daylight to load 10 premium cars, he still has to get to a safe overnight stop on this second leg of his 236-mile ride to Cheshire. You know, it's quite difficult in the daylight, but when it's dark, it's obviously that little bit harder to uh, see your decks and where to park it and everything. So, you know, we're really just, uh, you know, up against it you now. We need to get cracking on. Gareth carefully reverses the first car up the ramps. Then straps down the wheels and inserts chocks. Trucker speak for metal bars to prevent movement on the deck. If we didn't chock and strap it, I don't we'd even get out the gate before we damage this car. The rest of the cars for the top deck go on, manoeuvred into place inch by inch. Just slide that one in now. And then lift it up a bit. 
With the bottom deck still to fill and the light fading, Gareth's under pressure. Need to get cracking on. We're losing the light fast. We could do with some Wembley-style floodlights down here. At 5.30, the last car rolls on. But as he's liable for any damages to his load, there's still one last job to do before leaving. This is the really sort of crucial bit, if you like. This is the, uh, the make or break. We've got to make sure that we're below 16 foot or we're not going out that gate. 16 feet or five metres is the usual height clearance of bridges on British roads. Any accident and Gareth could be driving a push bike from now on. Take that up a little bit. Like that, just to sort of level that off. Then it's time for a strangely low-tech piece of kit. This is a uh, car transporter driver's best friend. It's a telescopic height stick. We use this to uh, measure the height of the truck. So we extend the stick up. Yeah, we're OK with that. We're quite happy with that. Yeah, that's not too bad. That's about 15 foot 7, so we're quite happy with that. Uh, just the back car to measure now. This is usually the one that uh, we normally struggle with. Be a little bit tight, I must admit. I'm just a smidgen below the 16 foot mark, so we're quite happy with that. Three hours after arriving, he's ready to roll. Let's turn and burn. Heading out of the docks, Gareth's hoping to make it as far as Birmingham, where, as a tramper, he'll bed down for the night. But only minutes down the road, he's faced with tail lights. It's certainly going to knock us back a little bit, is this? The best laid plans always seem to go out the window on this job. I would have hoped to have done about, sort of, uh, you know, 100 miles tonight, but uh, we might have to have a bit of a change of plan. After 20 minutes crawling in traffic, he finally starts moving. I think we're going to have to uh, stop a little bit short from where we originally were going to get to, so I think we'll uh, have to just do that and uh, make a bit of an earlier start in the morning. But stopping short means finding an alternative place to park. We can't just sort of park at, you know, the side of the road or in laybys or things like that. This is the kind of place where we don't want to stop. We're really sort of skinny layby. We need to uh, we need to make sure we're in a sort of safe and secure place. You don't know who's uh, who's around there in the night. Could be tampering with the cars. We don't want to wake up in the morning and find all the cars are on bricks. And it isn't only the cars he's concerned about. If they can't get into the cars, they might try and break in the cab and get the keys, so I could be in danger myself as well. Motoring into Berkshire, Gareth's worried he might be both out of pocket and carjacked. Yeah, we're hoping to get parked up in, uh, in services tonight. It's uh, sort of a nice, secure place to park. It's off the, uh, off the main road, so it should be nice and quiet as well. Get a decent night's sleep. Here's hoping. As the bright lights of the service station beckon, Gareth's made it to safety, relieved and ready to call it a night. Job done. Time for bed. 6 a.m. the next day. Morning. And Gareth's luxury cargo is still intact. Obviously, we've got sort of quite a high value load on, so you know you've got to be sort of extra vigilant and make sure that nothing uh, nothing untoward's been happening in the night. His first drop of two in crew is expecting him at nine. So Gareth hits the road for the 155 mile ride northwest. We've got about a three hour journey into our first drop. Obviously, we've got to get through some quite busy traffic places as well, like around Birmingham. So could have a few problems on our front door. We're backing up. We're backing up. Day dawns an hour and 20 minutes later, and as predicted, the traffic's at a standstill. It's the usual rush hour queues by the looks of it. We're down to sort of, you know, 10, 20 mile an hour, crawling along. The dealership in crew is waiting for the cars this morning, but Gareth's still 60 miles away. Looks like we've picked the wrong lane, as usual. Don't ever follow me into a queue at a checkout, because it just will not move. After an hour and a half crawling in tailbacks, this no-luck northerner finally leaves the notorious motorways behind. A little bit later than we thought we would be, but, uh, you know, shouldn't be too late, hopefully. We'll be there in about 10 minutes.
only half an hour overdue, Gareth pulls up in crew. But the transporter is too long to fit in the car park, so he's got to perform the offload at the roadside. We've got cars going past, even cyclists are coming past. So we've got to sort of keep them, um, you know, got to keep out what it's about. We've got to get the cars unstrapped and uh, keep sort of half an eye on the traffic. He successfully drops half his load, but it's a nail-biting weight as the salesmen carry out their inspection. It's always a bit nerve-wracking, is this? You know, hopefully they'll, uh, they'll give it a clean bill of health. If the dealers find just a single scratch, they may reject the cars. Everything OK, Matthew? Yep, they're all great. Right, lovely. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you. See you later, mate. Yeah. Cheers, bye for now. Gareth needn't have worried. With half his load signed off, he hits the road for his second drop 26 miles away. But it's slow going. He's holding us up a little bit at the moment. We need to get cracking on. Time's sticking away. Want to try and get up to Warrington as soon as we can. At anything up to 18.75 metres long, there's no chance of overtaking even a slow-moving vehicle. But at least the low speed means he can watch out for that other trucking nemesis. Yeah, we've got to be pretty careful on roads like this. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of overhanging trees. We need to sort of keep our wits about. Make sure that none of the cars on the truck come into contact with them. They could do a lot of expensive damage to these to a car, and we certainly don't want that happening. Patience and careful driving are the order of the day. After a 50-minute clear run up the M6, Gareth arrives in sunny Warrington and drops his final load. But following his inspection, the salesman has a laugh at Gareth's expense. We found some damage on one of the vehicles. I'll just show you the <laughs> damage that we've got. With just a mark on the tyre a cloth would wipe off, he's taking the mick. <laughs> Ever smiling, Gareth took it on the chin and heads back to the depot for his next luxury load. Coming up, tramper Paul Steele feels the heat keeping his plants alive on a frozen run in Scotland. It's not switching on. We have a problem. What a nice start to the day. While day driver Ian O'Neill faces the music near London's Royal Opera House. I'm trying to get to the Opera House. Where is it? Do you know? Excuse us, you know where the Opera House is? The red and green armada is a familiar sight on Britain's roads. Of 4,500 drivers, 750 are trampers who live in their trucks five days a week. It takes a certain kind of person to love life on the open road. You know, in this job, uh, that was going to be summer, sometime, eventually. But piloting his brand new baby, 35 year old tramper Paul Steele's pleased as punch. Nice truck inside, nice to drive, plenty of room. For the last few days, the UK's been in the grip of a deep freeze. It'll be a testing trek for this new truck, as our laid-back driver delivers a consignment of plants to Inverness. But before Paul can get on his way, he connects up a heater to keep the pansies pampered. And obviously, it's minus at the minute, so the heater has to be on so the plants don't die before we get the inverness. A few minutes of tugging at cables, but something's wrong. It's not switching on. We have a problem. Paul starts the truck to see if the battery's sending charge. Everything's fine, but the battery's switched on, but there's no life to the drill. What a nice start to the day. He's supposed to be in Inverness by half past two. Unless the cavalry can get him going, that's not looking likely. But it turns out to be a rather simple issue. Press hard on the button. Right. Jobs are good. That's you. On your way. We have life. Thanking his lucky stars, it was only a minor human error. There's just time to show off his gleaming new cab. Just had it two days. Starting to get familiar with it. As you can see, it's a bigger one. <laughs> Paul's Mercedes Actros is a long distance workhorse, but it's the cab interior that sets it apart. Called a Giga Space, 
The cab has 920 litres more room than other trucks. That's enough space to store an extra 28 crates of beer. Like the ultimate party pad, it has a 2.2 metre long bed. While a fold-away pillow means no more aching necks pouring over those haulage magazines by night. With 2.13 metres of headroom, even a king-size tramper will stand erect in the morning. And this lofty lorry driver is certainly the envy of the fleet as he hits the tarmac out of Cumbria. Today he'll be driving a marathon 250 miles. Heading out of the Carlisle depot, the first 100 miles of the motorway should be reasonably clear. But it's the final 100 miles up the A9, one of Britain's most dangerous roads, that will be the biggest test. Normally, if you're going to get any problems, that's where you'll get them on the A9, because it goes over a bit higher ground, so you can end up among a bit of snow, a bit of ice. Let's hope for a safe journey. Let's carry on. Get there in one piece. As Paul pounds the tarmac on clear roads up the M74, he relaxes and ponders his trucking background. My grandfather drove trucks and my great-grandfather had his own, I think. He had his own wagon. So it's kind of just passed down through generations, I think. Ah, <laughs> you think we're a bunch of diesel gypsies, are you? <laughs> Paul's been driving nearly four hours. By law, he must take a break in the next half an hour. But the next services at Perth are a way off. We've got 31 miles to Perth, and I've got 40 minutes to do it in. As the pressure to stop builds, Paul steers his heated hothouse onto the trucker's nightmare, the high-altitude A9. From what I believe, the A9's one of the most dangerous roads in Scotland for accident black spots and deaths. So... This is time to wake up a bit, keep it alert. Watch for idiots, watch for ice, watch for snow. Paul can't afford a mishap now. One slip could spell disaster. Yeah, you'd rather get there, even if it's late. You better be in there late than never. Huh? With legal driving time dwindling, there's still no sign of the services. Drop four hours, 12 minutes now, so... Next 18 minutes. I can't make it to where I actually want to be. There is a lay-by just before it, but there's obviously nothing there. It's gonna be, gonna be a lot bit tight, I think, looking at it. And it's not only icy roads and a ticking clock he's worried about. When we stop, I'll have to check, make sure the heating system's still on on the trailer. Minus temperatures like we have now. Plants will be dead. <laughs> Nobody wants to buy dead plants. <laughs> Find out later if this laid-back tramper makes it to his stop in time and with his plants still alive. Whatever the hour, deliveries are made around the clock. With three and a half thousand truckers working shifts day and night, there's always someone on the job. I can start any time between six and sometimes we do finish very late at night. We can do a 15-hour shift. 57-year-old Ian O'Neill has been driving trucks since he was 18, so knows what he's in for. There's no point in getting annoyed with anybody or jumping up and down. You just have to chill out and just think, well, we may have a better day tomorrow. It's a 5 a.m. start at the Crick Depot, where Ian seals up 20 pallets of pharmaceuticals and water on Connie, a regular-looking rigid, which is anything but ordinary on the inside. This sunny cone here, this is where the actual electric motor is. And uh, it just acts like a milk float. Connie is the only electric hybrid truck in the fleet. And Ian's amused she's so called because she's economical. You tell me a woman that's economical because I'll have it. No, 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 let's rephrase that. <laughs> uh, I can feel that uh, noose getting a bit tighter. She's a nice little girl, though. From the Crick Depot, Ian's got an 84-mile run to Ryslip in northwest London, where he'll make his first drop. Then it's 14 miles southeast into the busy capital to make a second delivery at the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden. 
After that, it's 20 miles east to the Averley Depot on the outskirts of London, where Ian will reload for the next day. It should be routine, but heading south, his drop in London is playing on this breezy Brummie's mind. Oh, I haven't done this one before, so... I think it's going to be quite fun because it's surrounded by one-way streets. It's all right finding the place, but it's finding where you've got to deliver it. Ian may come unstuck in busy London, but with clear motorway for now, he makes it to his first drop in just over an hour and a half. We're here. That's it. Thank God. But before he unloads, that troublesome next delivery is on his mind again. Let's see uh, how we're going to get in there. <laughs> Deep joy. It's 14 miles away. And it says it'll take us 41 minutes to get there. <laughs> Who's the comedian? 41 minutes. There's only one remedy for a bad journey ahead. A nice cuppa. Lovely stuff. Keep me going for a bit longer. With his first drop completed and the sun rising, Ian hits the traffic out of Ryslip and decides it's time to go hybrid. We're in the electric moment because the batteries are nicely topped up. So we'll, uh, we'll just toot along here because we're not going above 13 miles an hour. The Volvo FE Hybrid is powered by both a diesel engine and an electric motor located beneath honeycomb ventilation panels on each side. A motorised retractable platform on the back makes light work offloading up to nine tonnes of goods. At low speed, it runs off electric power, switching to diesel above 14 miles per hour. When engine braking, the electric motor works as a generator, delivering energy to the batteries. This system is perfect for in-town deliveries with lots of stop-starts. It's also great for the environment too reducing carbon dioxide emission, fuel consumption and noise by up to 30%. We do get some strange looks from people, like thinking, you know, that's quiet. And, uh, and then when the diesel kicks in, they go, nah, normal old diesel. But at the moment, she's very quiet. In fact, we can hear the, the blower a lot more than we can hear the engine. It's a milk float on steroids. I tell you, it's, it's great fun. <laughs> 20 minutes later, motoring towards London's Opera House in go faster diesel mode, Ian reflects on his own wheels of steel. I used to do a bit of uh, DJing, uh, mobile discos and uh, hospital radio DJing. The question is, does he do opera? No Pavarotti in my collection, no. Um, the closest I would probably say I've got is probably Barry White. Say no more. As he inches closer to the centre of town, the traffic starts to build and Ian's journey hits a bum note. Right. Sat now's gone silly. Unfortunately. I don't know where we are at the moment now. <laughs> Great fun. Take next right, then second left. Can we turn right there? But it looks like the road he wants is closed. What we've got to do is go up here, do a right and a left. This should be down here. We can't turn left, we can't turn right. What's on that road? Ooh, can't see. Going more offbeat by the minute, Ian ups the tempo. I'm trying to get to the Opera House. Where is it, do you know? Excuse me, do you know where the Opera House is? Can't be up there. I must come down here. Now, this is telling me to turn right. Where are 
are we anyway? The Strands! <laughs> oh, love it. Until finally reaching a crescendo, he takes action. Excuse me, my mate. So it's up here, turn left, first right. You're a sweetheart. Thanks, darling. Result. This way. Turn right. Half. Well, closed. Well, I see, lads, here. I'm trying to get to the Opera House, lads. How do I get there, then? Drive down and back up. Cheers, lads. Thank you. After all that, he was on the doorstep. Reversing in, Ian wastes no time offloading the three tonnes of water for tonight's thirsty guests. I hope the wife's watching this. She reckons I'll just sit on me bum all day. In less time than it took him to get lost, Ian's delivered the water and worked out why the drop was so tricky to find. Yeah, obviously we've had problems this morning getting into it because everywhere's been blocked off. Uh, it's because they're doing it for the BAFTAs. So it's all blocked off. Uh, they've got a carpet to the road yet, put a canopy all over there, and that's why it's absolute chaos here. But, hey, we're done. Who cares? Let's rock on. A much easier ride east through the capital, and as Ian traces the River Thames out to the Averley Depot, he finishes his run on a high note. The weather's beautiful, sun's shining, you've done your deliveries, everybody's happy. This is the best bit about the job now, and it's a Friday as well, which is even better. <laughs> Great. Coming up... Can Tramper Paul Steele make it to his stop in time on freezing Scottish roads? It's going to be half a tight, I think, looking at it. Or will dangerous drivers get the upper hand on this notorious northern ride? Patient van drive, very risky, very, very dodgy. That's probably what causes most of the accidents up here. With the fleet covering 750,000 miles a day, there's always someone battling Britain's most dangerous roads. Up in Scotland, where most of the high-risk highways lie, it's a treacherous trek up the notorious A9 for Tramper Paul Steele as he delivers plants to Inverness. If I was going to be on your guard when driving, especially in winter, because you know, things change fast. This laid-back lorry driver's got only minutes to reach a stop in his brand-new cab before his driving time runs out. It's going to be... going to be a little bit tight, I think, looking at it. A few more minutes of careful driving and Paul reaches the services in the nick of time. Job's a good one. Four minutes to spare. Got here with four minutes to go. It was a close call. A minute over time and Paul could have got a fine. Before he takes his break, he needs to check the heater in the trailer is still on. Ah, it's still working. Everything's still working. Plants are living over there. Time for food. 45 minutes later, Paul's back on the road. He has just over two hours to cover 90 miles to Inverness. But in these conditions, he can't afford to rush. The temperature's dropped to minus one now. It's definitely time to keep alert. Watch for patches of black ice. Almost impossible to see. Black ice is a dangerous road hazard for drivers. Edge of road there with bits of snow on. Could be ice underneath it. It's never ever been cleared, so just try and keep out at the edge a bit. Paul must use all his driving experience to guide the truck safely through this tricky pass. If you need a bit of ice and you try and brake to slow yourself down a bit, you, you could end up jackknifing. Most case scenario is accidents really, isn't it? It's gonna keep your wits about you. And on this freezing hundred mile stretch, it isn't just nature that causes a threat. People think it's a long straight road, so I think they can never take you, they get frustrated, sat behind you. They can't see far enough ahead. That's probably what causes most of the accidents up here. Here's what I mean, look. <laughs> Patient van drive. 
Wisely, the van driver sees Paul and doesn't overtake. Very risky, very, very dodgy. I was thinking about it. It's probably gone now. But before long, a car speeds past. And no wonder why there's accidents. <laughs> Man in a wagon here. He's obviously an Uri, you know. As other road users rush by, Paul's still 33 miles from his drop. He wants to deliver the plants and return down this tricky road in daylight. It's a bit, bit trickier in dark because obviously, like see black ice, you can't see. You've got certain areas surrounded by woodland, so it could be deer appearing from nowhere. As Paul descends from the high ground in twilight, the snow gradually disappears, and it's one happy trucker who finally reaches his drop. Hey! <laughs> it's nice if you think there's going to be some bad weather to get a nice clear run out. It's, you know, it's always a plus point, isn't it? A well-executed blindside reverse into his parking space, and Paul's a chirpy chappy. Tenno. <laughs> There's still one thing to check. Has the heater worked? Fancy's still alive. Job's a good one. I don't know which idiot strapped him in there. <laughs> the forklift driver wastes no time and takes Paul's plants off. And with the sun setting, he's got three hours' driving time left to pound the tarmac back down the A9. Night soon falls, but truck and trucker make it to their overnight stop intact. Hey, hey, we've done well. Parked up and proud his brand-new lady saw him through, this tidy driver must return the favour before he calls it a night. This is my over. It's not exactly Dyson. Get you the nooks and crannies that you can't always get into. The giga space needs a go over. My wife actually bought us this over for Christmas. The title we get is Tramper doesn't mean you have to live like a tramp. You tell him, Paul. Next time on Eddie Stobart Trucks and Trailers, tramper Craig Garside finds himself in a muddy mess. Bent all this, in it. Transporter trucker Gareth Ayres gets himself into a tight squeeze. You wouldn't like to park your car around here, would you? Never mind parking one of these trucks. Absolute nightmare. And tramper Dave Pickerel takes on his trucking nemesis. You get idiots like this reversing out onto fast moving traffic. This is why I hate London. Why I hate it.